Welcome in everyone and thank you so much for joining us today for the very first virtual support group session of the year. Um, my name is Kiana Hatfield and I'm the program director here at the Parkinson Association of the Carolinas. And today we have Melissa Wares, an occupational therapist from Duke Health talking to you all today about driving with PD. Just a few housekeeping things before we get started. Um, the, today's session is being recorded and will be available on YouTube later this week. Um, so if you have any questions on accessing that, feel free to reach out to us um, here at the office. Um, also, we will have a Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to use the chat box at the bottom of your screen as a parking lot for your questions, and we will um, answer those at the end. Um, but without further ado, I will pass it over to Melissa here, and thank you so much for um, being here today, all of you, and thank you, Melissa, for presenting. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Melissa. Um, like Kiana said, I work at Duke, and I've been here in February. It'll be 10 years, um, and I have my specialty certification in driving. So I'm a certified driving rehab specialist, which means I took extra course content and passed a certification um, to specialize in driving rehab. And so part of my care is that I work with people with Parkinson's um, at our, we call it our benchmark clinic. And we meet uh, once a week and we do a, a very comprehensive interdisciplinary team approach to care for, for our patients with Parkinson's. Um, and so in addition to that, I do just general neuro rehab and I do some other specialty clinics, which include ALS clinic and Huntington's clinic. Um, and then my, my driving um, evaluations that I do. I'm gonna get all into that though. Thank you again for having me. I always like to start off with what is occupational therapy? I know that I'm here to talk with you about driving and we will get to that, but not everybody knows what occupational therapy is. And it's a big part of my job, which I didn't know when I was in school is gonna be actually educating people on what occupational therapy is. So we call it the job of living is what your occupations are. So not just an actual job that you have, but anything you do in your day, an occupational therapist is going to be the one to work with you to make sure that you are doing the things that are meaningful to you and enjoyable to you as safely and independently as possible. And we know that symptoms of Parkinson's can make some of those meaningful daily activities more challenging. And so really the role of an occupational therapist is to maximize safety, maximize independence, maximize your participation in those things that are really important to you. And that may mean that we are recommending ways for you to adapt things that you do. Maybe we're making recommendations for equipment to use or doing things in a different way so that you can continue to engage in those meaningful roles, just potentially in a different way. Um, so that's what we do. So I wanted to just start also by talking a little bit about some of the symptoms of Parkinson's that may impact oh, those my. meaningful activities. Um, and so there's, we know there's motor symptoms and non-motor symptoms. Now this is a, a, this is not an exhaustive list and it doesn't mean that somebody with Parkinson's is gonna have all of these symptoms. These are just some symptoms that somebody with Parkinson's may have um, and th that they may also impact some of their day-to-day their -day participation. So some motor skills might be tremor, stiffness or rigidity, slowed movement, difficulty with coordination and balance, changes in posture and changes in sensation. And I don't mean feeling sensation like numbness or tingling, but more where your body is in space or how it's moving can change. And then some of the non-motor symptoms might be sleep changes in sleep patterns, uh, digestive issues like constipation, um, speed of thinking or cognitive skills, mood changes, pain, visual changes. Um, usually it'd be something like double vision would be one of the more common visual changes if somebody with Parkinson's does have vision changes, changes in expression of the face, um, and changes in voice. So again, how is occupational therapy going to help with these things? Exercise. Um, so it's not just physical therapists that work with the exercise component of, of um, somebody with Parkinson's, occupational therapists would work on recommending exercises 
and really exercises that focus on purposeful, intentional movements. And I'll talk about what intentional movements means um, in just a moment, um, but we might do more of these focused on some of the fine motor skills. We might focus on how your movement through exercise impacts function during those functional activities that you do. But exercise, there's so much research on the neuroprotective benefits of exercise and specifically with Parkinson's. Um, again, maximizing independence. So those activities of daily living that you engage in, we're making sure that you're doing those to the best of your ability and as safely as possible, how you're transferring from, from walking to um, chairs, to in and out of bed, in and out of the shower, on and off the commode, how you're getting around your home. How is your energy? That's another um, non-motor symptom is fatigue. Um, it's a very common, can be a very common symptom of Parkinson's. And then making a, a recommendations for adaptive equipment, modifying the way that you do things with compensatory strategies, and then um, making recommendations for if you have had changes in um, thinking tasks. And then another one, um, mindfulness. So what does that mean? It's sort of a big kind of umbrella term, uh, definitely one of those buzzwords these days, but mindfulness is really just um, a strategy for how to manage symptoms of Parkinson's. So we know that Parkinson's affects your nervous system. And if you have symptoms of anxiety or um, stress, we know that those symptoms can actually, some or those those things can make your symptoms sometimes worse. So more of a tremor if you're if you're feeling nervous or stressed. If you have uh, a time crunch and you're trying to get something done, sometimes people feel find that their symptoms may increase. And so there are actually a lot of strategies and research on the use of mindfulness on symptom reduction, specifically for Parkinson's. And so an occupational therapist may have extra training in those techniques as well. And then, of course, why you're all here is the assessment of driving. So that is under our scope of practice. We are the the we are the the uh, therapists that will look at your driving. Um, sometimes it has people avoiding wanting to see me because it's a tough topic, and we're going to get into that today. But your occupational therapist, even if they're not a specialist like I am, and with a certification, um, we all have general skills to at least screen for driving and then potentially refer you on to, to a specialist if needed. Um, and so uh, the screening by an occupational therapist would generally be by a generalist. And then if you do a clinical evaluation, that would be by a certified driving instructor. And then if you have a refer referral for an on the road assessment, again, that would be with a specialist. And we're gonna get into all of that today. I wanted to show this visual because I think it's such a great visual in understanding what's happening at the brain level as far as Parkinson's and then kind of what is our treatment approach. So I tend to show this visual to a lot of my new clients that I have that have Parkinson's so they can kind of understand what's going on and then what we're going to do about it. So we have two, two systems in our brain that regulate our body movement. Um, so we have a system called your extrapyramidal system which regulates your automatic movements. So movements you do without thinking about them. It's a lot of our movements. And then we have another system in our brain, completely different, that is regulating your intentional system. So that's your pyramidal system. Intentional move, your intentional system is intentional movements. So what's that? Movements you think about, movements you're really purposeful about. So you, you're giving more thought behind them. And so we have, I'm gonna use my mouse here. I hope you can see it moving. We have signals in our brain that go basically from kind of the top of your brain through the middle uh, to the spinal cord. And those signals are just represented in this picture by these green lines. So again, now I'm on your automatic movement system. Okay, so these green signals, your automatic signals, you can see are firing. They're going through your brain here. They're going through these gray areas. These gray areas are what stores your dopamine. And then you can see that some of those signals, those lines are going through these two purple things. That's your substantia nigra. That's those two little purple things are what make your dopamine. And dopamine is that chemical in your brain that's regulating your body movement. 
So this picture just sort of reiterates that it's your automatic movement system that is affected by Parkinson's. But the good news is, if we look at this visual over here at your intentional movement system, these, this picture is showing you your intentional movement signal. So the, when you have an intentional movement, those fire, those neurons firing through your brain, those are represented by the blue lines. So you can see that the blue lines, those signals have a different route, a different pathway in the brain. So they're bypassing these gray areas, okay? Your dopamine storage areas, and they're bypassing your dopamine maker, your substantia nigra. So we know that your intentional movement system is not affected by Parkinson's. And we can teach you strategies to use your intentional movement system instead of your automatic movement system. Um, and so let me give you some examples just to make this a little bit more clear. Um, so what are some examples of automatic movements? Well, it's a lot of our movements, but let's use handwriting. So handwriting is on an automatic movement. It's something that you probably learned to do when you were about five or six years old. At that time, you were very intentional about it, right? You were learning it, it was a new task, but once you mastered the task, it became automatic. So handwriting is automatic. A lot of people with Parkinson's complain that their handwriting has changed. It's, it's a common symptom. It's actually called micrographia where it's smaller. And so we know that it's affected because it's, it's part of your automatic system. However, you can make handwriting intentional again. How? Thinking about it, really being more purposeful about your handwriting. Um, it's like, you know, I use the example too of when I write a grocery list, my handwriting looks a lot different than if I write a greeting card. When I'm writing a greeting card, I'm being more intentional because I want my handwriting to look nice. So I'm probably writing a little bit slower, um, more intentionally, and it looks better. That's actually the strategy that I would teach somebody with a little bit, you know, practice and a little bit more. But I like to use that as an example because it's usually pretty easy to understand how the systems are different and how you can use the intentional system. Okay. Okay. So now that we know a little bit more about what's going on, we're going to get into the bread and butter, which is driving while you, while you are all here. Um, driving is an activity of daily living. We actually call it an instrumental activity of daily living, which just means it's a little bit more of a higher level task than for example, getting dressed. But why is driving so important? I mean, especially where we live, um, there's not a lot of other options, it seems, right? It's, um, it's something that we need to use to get around. Um, it's a rite of passage, especially for teenagers. Um, it's a symbol of our autonomy. A lot of people tie their self-concept and self-esteem to their ability or uh, to drive, a, a, a sense of personal competence. Um, <clears throat> being able to actually access the services you want to access it driving impacts our, our social and professional relationships so being able to actually get out into the community and being social getting to a job potentially um, it's part of a role that we may see as um as as for ourselves a role in our lives being able to travel and and not only just go to see friends and and go to work but also experience have new experiences and certainly that helps influence um, how we may see the world. So it's definitely important. <laughs> but the driving task is demanding. It's very complex. Um, you know, it is something that a lot of us have done for a long time of our lives. So we feel like, oh, it's, I got this. I've been doing this for so long. But changes in our body and mind can affect driving ability. So for some examples. <laughs> Visually, we need to be able to see traffic and road conditions, see road signs to be able to help us navigate. We need to be able to not only see that, but then have our brain recognize and process those images and then decide how to react. And then also perform the actual physical movements required. So managing a steering wheel, managing the pedals, managing the secondary controls, um, would be more of the actual physical part of it, but it's it's more than just physically driving a car. It's seeing, processing, and then performing. So it's a lot of things that we're doing. <clears throat> 
I like to show this visual um, just because it kind of gives a, I think it's a helpful visual in seeing um, sort of the hierarchy of um, what we do in our day to day. So like I mentioned, um, driving is much more complex than getting dressed, for example. So at the bottom of the pyramid, you can see that down there would be what we would call your basic activities of daily living, like dressing and bathing and eating. And then next step up, which are more complex things, would be things like being able to prepare a meal, managing medication and finances, um, more, more of those things that require cognitive capacity and ability to problem solve, um, that sort of thing. And then on top of that would be community mobility or transportation. So that is one of the higher highest level com complex things that we can do um, as one of our occupations because there's so much that we are, um, again, so much that we are doing <laughs> when we are driving. And um, the quote on top of I want to walk and drive. I don't need a job. And that's just a, a little bit of a joke because when people hear occupational therapy, they think we are talking about somebody's actual just job. Um, and some people are like, I'm retired. I don't need a job, but it's much more than that. Again, we say it's the job of living. So, so as far as determining, um, and you'll hear me say, um, fitness to drive. So what that means is just your kind of capacity to drive would be the fit, your medical fitness. Um, so who does this? Ultimately, the Division of Motor Vehicles, the DMV, is the responsible and legal authority for determining driving capacity and licensure. So as an occupational therapist, I don't take your license. I will do an assessment and I will make recommendations but I cannot, and I do not have the authority to physically take anybody's license. Um, that is the DMV's um, authority. In North Carolina, I'm gonna to speak to North Carolina. I believe we may have some people from South Carolina. Um, the laws are can be slightly different. South Carolina and North Carolina are generally pretty similar in their driving laws, I believe. But um, I know for sure North Carolina is a voluntary reporting state for your medical condition. So what does that mean? It means you're, it's not mandatory that you report your Parkinson's um, disease diagnosis to them. Um, they recommend you that you do, but it's not required. Some states it is mandatory. Um, so just wanted you to know that. So there are, like I mentioned, there are some inconsistent state laws. So like I said, some states are mandatory, some are not. And so I think it's just important to kind of know what your state laws are um, regarding medical conditions, um, because it can, if you if you move or that sort of thing, it could be different from where than from where you're from. Um, often the the driving instructors at the DMV actually don't have the medical background uh, to make some of these decisions. They just don't have that background. They're not trained. Um, and so there is a medical review board through the DMV. And um, some, if you get placed into the medical review system, then essentially um, the DMV will send, generally will send paperwork to your physician and ask them to fill things out. And basically with asking your physician, can you, can they drive safely with the condition that they have? And if your physician doesn't feel comfortable filling that out, then they will often send you for an occupational therapy evaluation um, to get more information. So they can, so our assessment can help them fill that out, if that makes sense. And then, um, like I mentioned, very in the very beginning of this presentation, occupational therapy is the emerging profession to address medical fitness to drive. So the physicians also have some training, but really it's our area of expertise and often um, they will uh, ph the physicians will refer their clients to occupational therapy for for their assessment so I'm going to talk to you now about what a clinical driving evaluation may look like um, of course I'm going to be speaking to my experience working at Duke in the clinical evaluation that we have. So I'm gonna give you some general information and then if it's very specific, I'll tell you that that's um, Duke specific, okay? Uh, I will also say there's not a ton of places across the, the two states that have um, 
these clinical driving evaluations. They were just, were not very, um, the certified driving rehab specialists are not very common. Um, I think there's maybe nine of us total in the state of North Carolina. Um, I'm not sure what the number is in South Carolina, but um, so we just don't have a ton of people who do these. So um, if you have to drive a little bit to get to an appointment, that might be why. But the clinical driving evaluation, and this is specifically with like a certified driving rehab specialist, um, they will do a comprehensive evaluation to determine, to determine, to determine your medical fitness to drive. Um, so it's an in-depth evaluation, specifically ours is about two hours. We say two to three, three is on the high end. Um, but just to make sure people are planning anything too soon after the evaluation, um, but generally it's about two hours and we're looking at four different areas of driving, which I'm gonna talk about briefly and then we'll go in more depth, but we're looking at physical ability, we're looking at vision, we're looking at cognitive skills, we're looking at reaction time. Um, some places may offer an on the road test. Uh, Duke does not offer it as part of our clinical assessment because of a liability issue. Duke won't allow us in the, in the vehicle with any of our clients. And so we, if we need it on the road, we will refer to a private company for that. It's not covered by insurance, which is sad <laughs> to me. Um, driving is not considered a medical necessity. So it is out of pocket and it costs, at Duke it costs $200. And uh, there's, again, a few other people throughout the two states that have different costs, um, but ours is $200 for the clinical. And we do require a physician's referral, ultimately because they're the ones that will follow up the conversation about our recommendation. Um, they're the ones that can send it to the DMV if they, if there are report to the DMV if they need to. Um, and so we, we, we want the referral so that you can kind of close that loop with the referring provider that you had. So what would you, what do you expect to kind of be talking about um, if you were in a clinical that we call this your client factors or your occupational profile. And this is all about you and your history. So what are your medical, what's your medical history? Other than Parkinson's, is there anything else going on? like seizures or diabetes, any other, any other conditions. We're gonna be asking about visual skills. Do you wear glasses? Do you have any history of eye conditions? What about your driving history? Do you have a history of crashes or um, how long have you been driving? What is your insight like? So insight into your, your potential difficulties or, or insight into what's going well. Um, we're gonna be looking at your physical skills. So strength, range of motion, sensation, um, RPWs, rapid pace walk test, a break reaction time. And I am still gonna get it, dive into a little deeper. Um, we're gonna ask about your cognition and your perceptual skills. And then if you've had any falls. And then the other things that we wanna look up, we wanna ask that we wanna ask you about as occupational therapists is the activity. So. What type of vehicle do you drive? Um, we know that the newer vehicles have a lot more of some of the um, autonomous controls um, or features. Um, some of the older vehicles do not. Um, and so we wanna know what type of car are you driving? What type of vehicle are you driving? Uh, where are you driving? Because different destinations have different um, hazards. And are you already self-restricting? Um, self-restriction just means, yeah, I stopped driving at night because I just don't like it. Or I avoid the highways um, because I don't, I don't want to go on them. So I take back roads, that sort of thing. Are you driving with other people? Do you have any job requirements that require you to, dr to drive? And about how often are you driving a week? So those are some things that will help us take into context what your driving habits are like and helps us inform our decisions as well. So um, we talked a little bit about this, but I wanted to just tell you a little bit more in depth about what physical assessments we do. So uh, ROM is range of motion. So um, you know what is your range of motion like in your legs, in your arms, in your neck, in your trunk? Um, if you if you can't turn your head and you don't have a backup camera, backing up might be be harder. Um, the rapid pace walk test is an assessment that 
has a correlation to driving. And if it takes you a certain amount of time to go a certain distance, it may indicate you may have more risk for, for being in an accident. We're looking at sensation and this is actually um, sensation like feeling numbness and tingling, um, your strength in your arms and your legs, your coordination, your balance, have you had falls, um, what your endurance is like. So, you know, how long um, are you able to participate in activities? How about, how's your mobility? Um, do you use any mobility device? And if so, can you get that into and out of the car independently? And then what is pain? What's your pain like? Uh, do you have any pain that's impacting you? Another assessment that we do as part of our clinical is a reaction time test. We have a simulator. So it is like a computer program with a, um, a wheel and a pedal, um, almost like a gaming system. And um, we're looking, reaction time isn't just literally the physical part of moving your foot from the gas to the brake. It is also involves um, the cognitive processing as well and the visual scanning. So that's what reaction time is. It's the actual motor control of using the pedals. It's the vision to see what information is coming to you and then processing that information and making a reaction. And I'm gonna go over vision quickly just because typically, um, you know, if somebody with Parkinson's had vision difficulties, it's usually a comorbidity or something else going on, unless it's double vision, um, which sometimes can be related to Parkinson's. But um, it is something too that people with Parkinson's can have is changes in their vision for other reasons. Um, but of course we use, we use vision to process about 90% of what we, we see, uh, or 90% of the information that we get is through vision. Um, and so we are processing a lot of visual information. And especially when we drive, we're looking at other vehicles, looking at road names, um, looking at lane markings, traffic signals, road conditions, seeing pedestrians, that sort of thing. So we do, we do use so much vision when we drive. So we have to make sure that you meet, you're meeting DMV guidelines for vision as well. And so we'll do a screen. Um, we do have the, um, it's called the Stereo Optic Rehab Vision Screener. It's this, this machine over here. And it just has slides that we look at that look at acuity, contrast sensitivity, peripheral vision, visual attention, um, depth perception, um, those sorts of things. And we do have, again, DMV guidelines that help inform what, what is or isn't meeting those, those guidelines. And then, so if somebody has changes in their vision, there are some modifications that may be recommended. You know, we're not gonna be the ones making those recommendations in regards to if you need glasses, but if we see something, we might say, hey, you might need to go back, go back and check in with your ophthalmologist. It's been a little bit of time. Uh, I noticed that, you know, you have these glasses, but your your acuity is, is not great um, and maybe, going back to the ophthalmologist can be helpful. Sometimes having restrictions um, is helpful. So like daytime driving only versus driving at night, if you have vision difficulty or avoiding driving in inclement weather like rain or definitely in the Carolinas snow. <laughs> um, and then there are some things in the vehicle um, that we can modify for, such as making sure you're in the optimized seating position, adjusting the brightness on dashboards and that sort of thing. Um, modifications for like using uh, a rear view mirror, um, an extended rear view mirror or a backup camera can also help compensate, especially if cha with changes in range of motion in your neck. Um, if range of motion is range of motion in your neck is an issue. Now this area is a little bit more common um, for somebody with Parkinson's to potentially have difficulty with, um, and that's visual perception. So visual perception, again, it's how our brain is interpreting what our eyes see. So there's different types of visual perception, um, like visual discrimination, visual memory, spatial relations, figure ground. Um, and it, we have a test that we do in, in, as part of our clinical where we'll take a look at that and see if there's any difficulty. But if you have difficulty with visual perception that make, might make things like 
parking more challenging, staying in the center of, of, a, of a lane, um, knowing and judging your stopping distance um, could also potentially be impacted. All right, so then another area that we're testing in clinic as well is cognition. So the thinking tests. Um, so these tests um, look at a variety of different areas. And the tests that we use in our clinic are researched and correlated specifically to driving. They're the, the, the skills necessary for driving, like some memory, um, attention, executive functioning, um, wayfinding, visual scanning. Those are all things that are important um, and skills necessary for driving. So the tests we use are looking at those skills and they further have been researched and the assessments have been correlated to driving or driving risk. And then another thing that we're looking at without a formal test necessarily is your is insight. So insight is basically the power or act of seeing into a situation. So really, um, you know, being able to recognize um, difficulty and then not only recognizing it, but sort of coming up with a plan for that, for how to deal with that or manage that. Um, older adults are, are less likely to cease driving due to medical issues. However, younger drivers also lack some insight at times due to cognitive abilities or lack of experience. Um, and changes in cognitive abilities may, um, may make it much more challenging to self-regulate their driving. So if somebody doesn't kind of maybe have the insight or notice that they're having difficulties, they're probably not gonna think they need to change their driving habits, for example. So what are some options? So, you know, some options for training uh, for fit medical fitness to drive is to get referred to occupational therapy, to work on specific areas. And this may, me may mean some pre-driving activities that you practice first um, or um, like route, route founding, finding or reading maps, that sort of thing. Um, passenger activities, that, and that's again for generally can be for newer young drivers, but it's also something that if you are have been driving and maybe you are um, taking a break from driving right now and want to get back to it, being an active passenger can be really helpful to actually work on some of the skills. Um, and being an active passenger basically means attending and paying attention to what's going on while you're a passenger versus driving. Um, but but paying attention, having a, conversa having a conversation about that with the driver, that sort of thing. Um, one option might be on the road training um, with a licensed driving instructor. Um, again, I mentioned this before, but potentially a referral to an eye specialist to optimize a vision if needed, or um, some options might be to return to driving with restrictions, which I'll talk about more in depth in a moment. If you're referred for an on the road, this is what this might look like. So an on the road is what it sounds like. It's a test on the road. It's performed by a licensed driving instructor or a, it can be an OT um, driving rehab specialist. Again, we don't do the on road portion at Duke, um, but some other places do. The evaluation is performed in the instructor's vehicle because they have the emergency brake on the passenger side. And then um, it may be in a variety of roadways and, and like city streets, highways, parking lots, generally um, they will try to take you where you typically drive. So if you don't drive on city streets, they probably won't take you on them. Or if you don't drive on highways, they probably won't assess you on them, especially if you don't want to drive on highways. Um, however, there are some closed courses and that would be um, like, they just have a setup in a parking lot. Um, and that's really just specific to the driving instructor company, not um, anything that I can control or recommend. Um, but what they're doing is similar to what you might have might see at the DMV is they're assessing your driving. They're looking to see how you control the vehicle, how you're planning, how you're, um, you know, following the directions that they're giving you, um, making sure that you're stopping within a, in a, a, a reasonable amount of time. Uh, making sure that you're demonstrating good safety and judgment. Um, and so for, for me, if I'm re recommending somebody do an on the road after they've done my clinical, 
what happens in, with us is that we get the on the road evaluation back from the clinical, uh, excuse me, we get the on the road evaluation back from the driving instructor, and then we review it. And we're looking at your clinical, we're looking at your on the road, we're looking for any um, common um, challenges maybe, or, or things that went well. Um, and we're looking to see that helps us inform our decision for next. So what is our recommend, recommendation going to be? So here are what the results might be. So like I said, we get the on the road back if you've done one, or we're looking at your clinical evaluation, we might recommend restrictions. So maybe if you have difficulty with contrast sensitivity at night, we might recommend daytime driving. Um, you know, if, if there's, if there's some challenges, but not anything significant enough for somebody to recommend that you stop driving, then we might, but some, some difficulty, then we might say, here are these restrictions um, that sort of align with, with where you want to be driving and, and what your goals are for driving. And here, here are these restrictions we can recommend that will keep you safe. Um, again, the, after a clinical, the recommendation might be, ah, we need a little bit more assessment. Um, we've done this clinical part, but I think I'd really like to see how you are in a true driving scenario on the road um, in, the, in the areas that you would typically drive. So I'm gonna recommend the on-road evaluation. Now that is the gold standard. Um, ultimately. So having a clinical and on-road evaluation together is the gold standard. Um, and so, you know, if you are referred for that, it just means they need more information that it, it, it can re be really informative um, to help make recommendations. One possible option to, or result, I should say, one possible result may be to discontinue driving. Um, and that would be, you know, if there is enough evidence that something, things have changed enough that demonstrate you are an increased risk or a significant increased risk for being in an accident, we would recommend that you don't drive. Um, and then at that point, we too would also talk about alternative community mobility options because we still want you to get from point A to point B um, and getting to point B is very important. It just may mean doing it in a different way, potentially, if we've recommended no driving. Um, and so a part of our role is to make sure that you have options for alternative ways to get into the community still. So as far as intervention, um, there may be recommendations for, uh, and this is intervention from an occupational therapist. Um, so adaptive equipment prescription and training. So that could be like uh, extended rear view mirror would be adaptive equipment in a car to help you. And then how do you use that? Um, behind the wheel training or lessons. So, you know, maybe having some extra training with a certified, with a driving specialist could be really helpful or excuse me, a driving instructor. Um, having some training can be helpful. They, there are places that do that. Also, you may get a recommendation that you go to occupational or physical therapy to specifically focus on some remediation of, of some of the challenges or changes that you've had, like physical or cognitive skills. Um, other training could be travel training. So just recommendations on how to continue to get you into the, the community. Um, recommendations for getting in and out of the vehicle, how to manage your, mo mo excuse me, your mobility device um, in and out of the vehicle as independently and safely as possible would be other potential interventions from an occupational therapist. And then part of our role too is counseling. So, you know, again, I hope nobody ever tells you you can't drive and then they don't tell you, say anything else. Um, really making sure that you are, if, if the recommendation is that you no longer drive, um, it's our role as occupational therapists to help with transportation planning. So that again, you can continue to get out into the community and continue to engage in the meaningful things you want to, even if driving isn't, isn't safe for you to continue to do. Um, and so that would be the role of occupational therapy as well. 
Um, there is a transportation cost worksheet and sometimes it's helpful to use that um, just so you can kind of see what the cost of alternative driving options are and what the cost is, is of maintaining a vehicle because there are a lot of costs that do come along with both of those things and sort of seeing um, how sometimes if you're not you know, spending the money on the gas and the insurance and the other car maintenance upkeep that some of those funds can go towards alternative options for community mobility. And so what are some of those options? I'm just gonna give you very brief um, kind of general options um, and then some resources for more where you can look up more specifics, but family and friends can be a great, um, option. So if you have that support and they're willing and everybody's sort of on the same page, um, it can be a really good option for community mobility. There are tons of programs out there, um, such as volunteer ride programs that may be available, volunteer drivers, some public impaired transportation can be appropriate. Sometimes it's not. Um, ride sharing apps like GoGo Grandparent or Uber or Lyft, taxi services, um, however, it is important to consider some contraindications, the fact that if you are in a more rural area, some of these, some of these options are not as readily available. Um, and so, you know, also not recommending somebody with maybe severe, um, mobility difficulty, trying to walk and get onto a bus or something wouldn't be appropriate. But, um, those are all some things that again, an occupational therapist can help problem solve with you and work through with you. And so I'm just gonna wrap up now and um, just uh, sort of give you another reason why um, occupational therapy services are so beneficial for people with Parkinson's because I think that occupational therapists can work with, with you to do a lot and continue to live very well with Parkinson's. Um, and that may mean adapting environment, it may mean um, helping to restore as much function as possible, helping you to participate in meaningful activities, improving your quality of life, helping to prevent secondary complications. So if you have never seen occupational therapy and you feel like you could benefit, I would certainly recommend reaching out to your neurologist to see. Um, specifically, a neuro-trained occupational therapist would be the, the best, um, just because we do have a lot of that extra training. Um, they are harder to find, especially if you live out more in the rural areas, but, um, you know, even a referral to even a more general occupational therapist can sometimes be helpful. These are just the locations that we have in this area. Um, and I can certainly try to get together a list um, of places that are more outside of this area. Um, but these are our locations that have neurotrained OTs through the Duke system. But that is it. Um, so now I think we can open it up for questions. Yes, thank you, Melissa. So um, we do actually have one question already in the chat box here. Um, and so um, Marsha asks, can we, um, can walking be made intentional? Um, I know earlier you were talking more about that. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So with Parkinson's, um, what happens with, with walking, um, steps tend to be maybe a little bit smaller. Um, and again, that's because walking is automatic. Um, it's something that we just do, um, without thinking about it, but you can be much more intentional by trying to take bigger steps. That's literally the strategy is, okay, I'm going to walk bigger, more powerfully, but ultimately I'm going to put a plug in for physical therapy. If you feel like it would be helpful, ask your neurologist for a physical therapy referral, and they are the ones that will be able to really help you um, learn strategies for your, your gait and your, your walking and mobility. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, Brenda asked, um, is OT covered by insurance? Yes, it is. Um, generally speaking, if you, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, and then all of the general insurances do cover it. Um, and so it, and even home health, if you needed home health, generally that's all covered. So, you know, definitely check with your insurance policy, but um, sometimes with the more private insurances, there may be a copay, but Medicare and Medicaid, I don't believe have copays or very small ones generally. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, we have another question here. It says, what is the liability of a person with Parkinson's if they have a car accident and hurt someone and haven't had a driver assessment um, or have informed the DMV of their health status? That's a good question. So, and I'm not a lawyer. So <laughs> let me just start by saying that um, I cannot give you any formal legal advice, but that's a, a question that I do get often is what is the liability? So, you know, if... I'm going to answer, I guess, more from the standpoint, if you have Parkinson's and you did have an evaluation, let's say, and it was recommended that you don't drive and then you get into an accident. So that's not the question you asked, but I'm going to answer it in that way first. Um, so if you drive basically against medical recommendation, um, you are going to be held liable. Um, even if, you were like rear-ended or something and it was not even your fault. If you've been recommended to discontinue driving and you drive, basically no matter what, you would be held at fault. Your your medical records can be subpoenaed, um, can be subpoenaed and, and then used um, in court. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. Um, if you have Parkinson's and it's never been addressed, and you haven't, uh, I mean, I don't, I can't actually answer that question because I don't know, but I want to say that the fact that um, North Carolina is a non-mandatory reporting state, I feel like there's probably going to be some leeway there, but I can't, I cannot um, totally answer that. Well, thank you. Yes. Um, and I do want to go ahead and open the floor up to anyone. If you have any questions and you don't feel like typing it in the chat box, feel free to unmute yourself. Robert, did you have a question? Okay. All right. Does anyone else have any questions for us? Yes. <clears throat> did you hear me? Yes. yes. Ms. Jameson. Mm -hmm. Hi. What is the, I missed the first 20 minutes of the program. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, what is the first step that one should take? As far as assessment for driving? Yes. Yeah. So ultimately, I think the first step would be talking to your neurologist okay. and say um, either I am interested in getting a driving assessment or I'm interested in occupational therapy. Um and they should be able to help get you to the next steps. Okay. So yeah, I would say the first step would be reaching out to your neurologist. Yeah. For an occupational therapist um, it, assess, assessment or for what? Well, if it's, yeah. So, you know, if there's anything else impacting your function. So if it's, if it's taking you longer to get dressed because you have slower movements or um, tremor, let's say, or anything that's really a, a impacting you functionally, um, ultimately an occupational therapy assessment would be very helpful, I think. Um, and so you can start there if you want, and then you can talk to your occupational therapist about driving. Um, and then they might be able to help you sort of get to the next steps if they're not a sort of, like, if they don't have the training in driving hopefully they yes. can help you at least get to the next tr the, the specialist um so i would say if you have any other things going on that are impacting function i would start with an occupational therapy evaluation okay thank That's you true. yeah um, and Ms. Jamison, just so you know, um, our session today um, is recorded so it will be available on youtube later this week um, and then we have a couple questions here in the chat box. Um, how can we find all the other locations of OT driving assessments? 
Um, and then it's a, it's a two-part question. Um, does UNC um, system have a similar program uh, because there are neurologists within the UNC system? Um, UNC does not have a similar program to my knowledge. Um, they do have some OTs that do some driving screening though, I believe. I just don't think it's a formal clinical evaluation. Um, so certainly if you are in the UNC system, I would reach out to your neurologist and just say, hey, I'm interested in um, getting assessed. Um, can the OTs here do it? Or, or we, we certainly get people from even though we're Duke, we do see people from UNC. <laughs> um, that's kind of a joke, but um, we love UNC and um, happy to see people since it's not too far if you feel like they don't have the, um, what you need, what you're exactly looking for. But um, again, you can start with an OT referral because I, I think I think OT is so help, can be so helpful um, to work with people with Parkinson's to just learn some strategies that can help you move better in general, and then they can also assess driving. <laughs> hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, hi. Um, I don't have Parkinson's. My husband does. And um, I usually try and drive with him, but I find sometimes when I'm driving with him, I can't always pay attention to the road. The phone might ring, something might happen. I might need my attention elsewhere. And um, that worries me, and it worries me when he drives alone. Um, he can't drive at night anymore. He had an accident at night because he couldn't see exactly where he was going. Uh, thankfully, nobody was hurt. It was just uh, jump to curb, first a couple of tires. But um, you know, I, I'm concerned about his daytime driving alone. He seems mm -hmm. to be okay, but he tells me he does better when I'm with him. Yeah. Yeah. So one, one concern I would have, um, is what we would probably consider you, um, is a co-pilot, um, yeah. right. So, you know, when, when the passenger of the vehicle is sort of, um, giving instructions, um, kind of helping point things out and, you know, we would call you kind of a co-pilot. Um, and although, that's so kind of you. The problem is, is that that's one extra sort of set of instructions to process. And then it's processing it in delayed, right? Because you see it, process it, then verbalize it. Then he's processing what you've said. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? And so that well, could... we usually try and say it with plenty of time. Like if we're approaching a red light, I'll say, you know, don't forget to slow down. <laughs> things like that, yeah. <laughs> even though yeah. he would most likely, but yeah, you know, just to be sure, stop sign over there, you know, things yeah, like that. totally. And so, ultimately, what I would say is that you know, having a, a clinical evaluation can just give you objective information, um, and just you know, have you have more peace of mind, um, that okay, he's had this clinical and this clinical evaluation and it either maybe it went well and, and this is working and just kind of gives you a peace of mind. Is um, this the thing his neurologist could do? You certainly can ask. Yes. Some, I think some neurologists feel more comfortable addressing driving than others. Um, and so if they don't, then they would probably say, let's get you referred to a specialist. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And it looks like we have another question. Um, if a person with Parkinson's has problems with freezing of gait um, when walking, can this freezing translate into um, occurring when they're driving? It can. I have heard of it happening and I've seen it happen. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean it will, but it can. Yeah. So it'd be the same kind of concept. Um, and again, it's sort of at the brain level with that freezing of gait, it would just be happening with um, transitioning the feet between the pedals. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, I don't see any other questions in the chat box. Um, does anyone else have any questions before we wrap up today?
And I'll say um, while we're waiting for any more questions, um, if you hadn't had the chance to go ahead and um, maybe take a picture or write down um, Melissa's information here. Um, but if you don't have the chance to capture it, feel free to reach out to us here at the office and we can connect you. And um, thank you all. Um, I don't think I see any other questions. We have some comments coming in. Um, thank you, so informative. Thank you, this has been very informative and helpful. Um, so we will go ahead and wrap up for the day. Um, yeah, people are still saying thank you here. So um, Melissa, I'll let you look at those. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. I hope um, you were able to get a lot of information out of this session. Um, again, as a reminder, this session is being recorded and will be available on YouTube later this week. Um, but in the meantime, if you miss anything or have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or Melissa if you got her information. Um, but again, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Melissa, for um, all this good information, and I hope to see you all at a PAC program soon. Well, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Let me stop recording. <laughs>